time in Zambia on AIDS awareness and working with teenagers about AIDS awareness and working with the Catholic Church. And it was a profound experience for him. But when he came home, he said to me the most critical thing he'd ever said about the church. He said, Dad, in this country, you're just playing church. That hurt. That was a big challenge. And this afternoon, I know that Peggy is going to pick up that with her talk because it is the discipleship challenge in the 21st century. Can I just clear up, because I wasn't very audible this morning, when I did say she was the first um, female clergy person, and I think people th thought that was the end, but of course it was the first female clergy person to become the sec general secretary of the denomination, which meant that's why the question was asked, do you also have a church? Because they, they didn't hear that. So thank you for, for, for clearing that up. And therefore I invite uh, Peggy, if she would please challenge the church. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I would like to assure you that the afternoon uh, presentation is very short because I know that when people just come back from lunch, <laughs> they'll be going to bed, even if beds are not here. So, <laughs> so I don't want people, I don't want to force people to go to bed. So I want to assure you that it's very, very short, and I just did it deliberately so that we are, we are together. We continue with the, the same subject on the uh, discipleship challenge in the uh, 21st uh, century. While there are external challenges to discipleship, there are also internal complexes in our churches today, not only here or not only in URS, but also back home. Christianity and church life is complex today. And we can all talk about you know, this because I know you have your own challenges, we have our own challenges, but at the same time, this is the time and the generation that God has given us in which to, to save. For example, theolog theologians want to argue about the right definitions of gospel and other you know, subject, subjects. And sometimes we really want to defend the dogmas and what, you know, the cow bath, bonhoeffer, name them. I'm not criticizing them because they laid the foundation. But sometimes we can be spending a lot of time on these, on the expense of what God wants us to do. They are programs and projects which the churches run that turn into bureaucratic complex corporations. And this reality sometimes impairs mission. The beauty of simplicity in what the early church did is a huge lesson for the church today, whether from, you know, the West or Global South. The core practices of the church, of the early church and historic, historic sacraments coupled with evangelism and discipleship practices are part of the revival the church needs today. To go back to the early love as the writer to the book of Revelation puts it. The more complicated the church becomes, the less impact it will have on the world. The church should not lose or compromise its divine impulse in what it does you know, or says. 
many are the times when the church has divided itself. A vivid example is the case that we are experiencing now in Zambia, where politicians have infiltrated, you know, the church. At some point, we were divided because the state wanted to build a cathedral. And even now, they are building. They invited leaders from different churches. And then uh, many of us were opposed to that. And we requested the government that if they had a lot of money, why not give that money to the churches to build more churches and not for them to build a cathedral? Because we didn't see any sense in that. But even within the mainline churches, we were divided. Others were saying, we have to go for it. When some were saying, no, it was not right for us to endorse what the government of the day you know, wants to do. So sometimes there are many issues that can make the church to divide you know, itself. And the kingdom divided in itself cannot go anywhere. Jesus did allude to that. Let me talk a little bit about the emergence of new expressions of Christianity. The capitalist and consumerism world lifestyles have not spared the church. And the reality of church shopping is uncontrollably growing. Getting from the sermon, Bible study, something that suits our comfort zones. And many are the times when we do not want to, like somebody, you know, puts it, bite the bullet. Sometimes many of us are comfortable just to do things that suit us. We have very little uh, room for other things, you know, to come in. We want the usual to go on and on and on. Even when the new expressions are coming in, sometimes we have to go and talk about this, if that thing is relevant, you know, or not. Pastors and church leaders are not spared in this. And there is a tendency to choose churches that we prefer just as one would choose a car, clothes, you know, or shoes. This is happening in my church. Somebody can be said, sent to this rural congregation who just say, I can't go to that you know, congregation because what are they going to give me at the end of the day? And so they want to go to congregations that will look after them or buy this car. Others are even choosing the kind of car or a vehicle that they would want to be, you know, driving because they saw somebody else driving a Royce, you know, Royce. So for him, he wants a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> Sometimes we spend much time on this instead of spending time on discipling the people of God. Churches must challenge such mentality and expression of faith. The church should not cut and fertilize the growth of such mentality. Churches, I believe, should become places of Christ's invitation to join God in what he is already doing. Can I hear? Amen. (laughs) Thank you so much. (laughs) Be and do whatever is right philosophy of expressive individualism is fundamentally at odds with Christianity, which causes us to bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
whether we like it or not, if we are ministers of the gospel, if we believe that miss your day is not ours, it's, you know, it's not about me, then we should follow the one whom we are proclaiming to be the head of the church and the head of what we are doing. Religious freedom, to what extent churches must disciple people to bow to the lordship of Jesus Christ as revealed in you know, scripture. I know many of them, they have got nothing to do with God because they think they have everything. And I want to believe that they don't have everything at one time. I witnessed a situation where somebody whom we thought had all this money and everything that, you know, humanly we could think he was comfortable. But in the end, he ended up committing suicide. And as I sat in my closet, I said, what must have led this man to do what, you know, he has done? There should be something that must have been missing, which we have not addressed. So yes, somebody can have whatever they can have, but there will be that absence in somebody's you know, life. And the scripture has to fulfill that, especially if somebody bows to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So to what extent should the church again Tolerate religious freedom. We are a church. And we know what we are supposed you know, to be doing. But sometimes we just let it loose. For people to do what they want to do. And sometimes we call this, you know, that is a private life. We shouldn't be, you know, interjecting or going into somebody's life. Because that's his life. That's our life. But my question is. To what extent, especially as disciples and learners of Jesus Christ, there were times when disciples wanted to do what they thought was right, but Jesus brought them back and said, if you are my follower, do what I tell you to do. So to what extent? Because we can end up doing what the world is doing, doing everything that the world is doing, and that's doing everything that the world is doing. So what's the difference? Why should I go to church? Why should I submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Because there's no difference. To, to what extent? Sometimes you meet opposition. Especially when you want to do things right. And people will think you're antisocial. You don't know what you are doing. You are not sociable. But maybe that opposition, <laughs> if Jesus met that opposition and led him to the cross, who are we not to meet that opposition? So that we may put things right and leave the gospel as handed over to us. So who we'll choose maybe to live comfortably and the gospel just be one of those, you know, things. I remember one of my ministers saying, for me, I don't still have a calling. This is just a profession like, you know, any other profession. So it's just about fulfilling programs. Because I don't, you know, still have a calling. So he's still being cancelled so that he can come to terms with the calling. Because if he has not been called, why is he is in the church? If it's just to save and receive a stipend or a salary at the end of the month. Attention. Again, <laughs> many of us would want, especially where I come from, at least you 
our colleagues here are spared. But us as <laughs> men and women of God, we really seek attention. We want everybody to recognize that, oh, there is Reverend Peggy. We want attention on the expense of, you know, saving people. Sometimes we want to page ourselves very high as if, you know, us, we are holy, and then these others are sinners. When Jesus himself discourages us from that kind of notion, but for us to be part of the community so that we can serve them better and we can understand some of the struggles that they go through, just like Jesus came so that, you know, he could live among us and even understand the struggles and how sometimes, you know, we face different challenges even when we want to serve him in the manner in which he would want us, you know, to serve him. Then the other one, attempting to please Oh, by sometimes doing things that even Jesus himself would not, you know, approve of. And if we attempted to do this, then where is the gospel that frees people? from these, you know, things that hold them captive. These are things that come to destroy, things that come to kill, and the thieves that come to steal. Attempting to please everything and everyone and, you know, when we are called to, to disciples, so that we may be examples of many. I keep on telling my ministers that, you know, sometimes it's not even a, uh, good to preach, but just our lifestyle will speak volumes to people, and they'll be able to see Jesus Christ in us and come to the saving knowledge of God. Because it's not about the words or the beautiful words. You know, the way we package them. The way we say them. It's not about that. It's about, you know, how we live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even when everything says no. No. Even when all the odds come your way. Just your life will be able to speak louder than words. Tempting to please. Oh, even when we have been called to live a life where the living, so that when all is said and done, people just say, yes, I think it pays to follow his or our God because of the kind of life that this minister leads. Thank you. to say any fancy words.